Well, good morning. Good to be with you. Uh, my name is Mark DeJay, and um, so I, I'm a Cleveland kid who has spent over 20 years now living in the Pittsburgh area. So when I come to church and I see a Miles Garrett jersey, I am <laughs> delighted. So thank you. <laughs> Makes me feel right at home. Uh, greetings. Uh, I am in the Pittsburgh area. I'm in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. As Eric shared, I work with our presbytery and with our denomination. Uh, and so the conversation that I want to have with you this morning is one absolutely for Bay Presbyterian, but it's actually a similar conversation to one we're having all across the country. And so um, you heard the Great Commission today, and that's really important to our identity as a denomination or a, uh, a family of churches. Um, our denomination, as we all know off the top of our heads, is the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Great. And so what that means is uh, you have a specific call to this local community. We want to encourage, equip toward that. Um, but you're also a part of something bigger than yourselves. You're a part of the body of Christ first and foremost. That's a thousand times more important. But then your connection with this specific group of about 630 churches from across the country, uh, 74 from this region of the country, uh, is meant to be something that is both encouraging, inspiring, and challenging for us to lean into what that looks like together. And so how we hold being Presbyterian in this way, specifically for our denomination, if you could put that slide up there that talks about the mission of the EPC. The EPC exists to, gary, to carry out the great commission of Jesus. That's what Eric just read for us. We exist to carry out the great commission of Jesus as a denomination of Presbyterian, Reformed, Evangelical, and Missional congregations. Real quickly, what that means, Presbyterian in our polity. That's how we structure ourselves. That's like the elder stuff, right? That's our Presbyterianism. Uh, reformed is our theology. We are explicitly reformed theologically. Evangelical is like our conviction. That's our passion for seeing lost people found in Christ, people meeting Jesus and coming to new life in his name. And then missional has to do with our posture and practice in the world outside of the walls of the church. And so missional means our posture and our practice that we are not fight and flight people. We are not culture warriors. We are salt and light influence. We, we live to bear witness to the good news of the universal reign of God in Jesus Christ in the particular places where God has put our congregations on purpose with a purpose. Congregational life is communal, it's corporate, it's collective, and then it's also individual. You live this out in your day-to-day -day life as you go. Community groups is a great example of the church in smaller groups living into these rhythms of what it means to be a disciple. And so I want to talk to you a little bit today about discipleship from the perspective of the Great Commission. If we are called, if you are called to carry out the Great Commission of Jesus in this particular way, what does discipleship look like? Because we heard in the Great Commission today that we're called to make disciples. That's the, the call that Jesus gave to his first disciples. We believe it wasn't just for them. It's for anyone who knows Jesus today. And so one of the ways that you can simply think about that is for the EPC, we want every congregation to be an embassy of God's kingdom and every member to be an ambassador of Jesus. Every congregation, an embassy of God's kingdom and every member an ambassador of King Jesus. Um, one way to think about this, this Great Commission discipleship, um, Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary in the early 20th century in India, very formational and a lot of people thinking about what it means to be this kind of church. If you pay attention to the next couple of years in the EPC, you'll hear his name brought up and, and this ethic brought up quite a bit. This is from a book he wrote uh, called The Gospel and Western Culture, Foolishness to the Greeks. He says this, the church is not meant to call men and women out of the world into a safe religious enclave, but to call them out in order to send them back in as agents of God's kingship. Call them out, called, chosen, elect, in order to be sent back in as agents of God's kingship. 
Um, I think it's really healthy for every church to go through a process similar to what you all have been doing, kind of refining that sense of mission and vision for a new season, discipleship as a part of that. What does it mean to be disciples? The church I planted about 15 years ago, we went through a whole year of just defining discipleship for our context, right? For this specific community of faith in this particular place, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, what does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus. And we came up with this like three line, really kind of dense and rich uh, description, but then the, the kind of the, the, the motto, the real simple bite-sized version that I think travels is this, a disciple is a friend and follower of Jesus Christ. Disciples are friends and followers of Jesus Christ. And so for us to be those people in the world, for you, Bay Prez, to be a congregation that equips your people to be friends and followers of Jesus Christ in the world. In light of the Great Commission, what does that look like? Um, Before we step any further, let me pray for our time here this morning. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for uh, being who you are, for making us who you've called us to be, calling us together, giving us the joy of belonging in you and in a new identity, giving us a new life to live. And so will you inspire us again by your Holy Spirit through your scriptures, inspired by your spirit, um, to help us to know not just about you, but to know you and what it means to be your people. In Christ we pray, amen. So I like um, preaching through a smaller passage because you can actually take it kind of a bit at a time. So I wanna just walk through a little bit at a time in this passage today, the Great Commission, in, in light of discipleship. What are we being shaped and equipped and discipled for? Uh, And in verses 16 to 17, right off the bat, is it possible to bring up the verses 16 and 17 again? There's a detail, great detail, that I think is easy to miss, and it's in verse 17, where it says that after they've all been gathered, it said um, that they believed, but some doubted. There it is, verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus said, doubters, go stand over there, And all the rest of you, no, it doesn't say that, does it? (laughs) They believed and some doubted, but then Jesus speaks to all of them, doesn't he? Right, those who came, Jesus was commissioning all of them. There's sometimes this idea that we can have is that, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, um, but I'm not like a great Christian, I'm not like a professional Christian, I'm not like a first stringer, And so like that's for them and maybe someday I'll do this. And if you're thinking that, it's not just you. One of my uh, mentors in ministry years ago had just came to pastor a church, large church, about 1,500 people, very successful by all appearances, large and programs and money and all of this. And he had an elder retreat with his elders early on. And he described this elder retreat. He had planned a whole strategic time together. and, And the opening devotion was about being disciples. And he got about a minute into it, and one of the elders raised his hand, and he said, oh, pastor, no, 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 I'm not a disciple. My mentor said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm not that good a Christian. I would never call myself a disciple. Another elder said, oh, me too. I'm not that good a Christian. I could never, maybe someday I'll be a disciple. And, and so that scrapped the agenda for the retreat, and they had to go back to some basics here. It's not like disciples, there's like kind of a pecking order, and some of the, like, this is for all of them. Those who believed and those who doubted together, they were with Jesus. And so they were all commissioned. Friends, discipleship in the Great Commission is not for a few folks to be encouraged by other folks. It's for all of us. It's for all of us. And so if you're here today, if you're today and you don't know Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. And I hope you get to hear a little bit of what our heart is as people of faith. Um, to be light in the world for the glory of God and and the blessing of the world that he loves. If you are a follower of Jesus, someone who knows him, like the call of discipleship is for you too. It's for all of us together. And so as we think about what that looks like, um, Ephesians chapter four uh, talks about how the gifts of the spirit being given to some. And so in our Presbyterian way of understanding, we do elect elders Elders are not the ones who are called to do the ministry. It says in Ephesians chapter four, this special calling is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That means that their job is to equip all of you to be about the work of God, and we're talking here, the work of the Great Commission. 
Um, and so I, I've heard sometimes uh, the, the 80-20 rule, I, I work with a lot of churches, and if it's a huge church or a tiny church, this still holds true. Have you heard the 80-20 rule? 80% of the work done by 20% of the people, right? Or, or I heard it described better this way, I thought. Um, it, it's like sometimes a, a soccer game uh, or a football match, if I'm trying to sound like I uh, am in Europe, uh, where you have 22 people badly in need of a break, being watched by 50,000 people badly in need of exercise, <laughs> right? But, but, but God has a much better idea than that, that, that in, in great commission discipleship, there's no spectators, that we're all on the field, we're participants together, and that's on purpose. Uh, and, and sometimes you might think, well, what is God thinking someone like me? I'm not, I'm not ready for this. Read the scriptures and find all the people who by no means looked like they were ready, but God was calling them. And it's not you as an individual, it's into a community to be equipped and then a part of God's work in the world. Um, Verse 18, Jesus says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, the king, with all the authority of the kingdom. It starts with Jesus. Jesus doesn't gather them together and say, here's your to-do list. He starts with himself, because that's where it all comes from. The Great Commission Church is committed to disciple-making in a way that is about bearing witness to God's kingdom in the world. It's not about empire-building, and it's not about spiritual self-improvement for its own sake. So it's not about building like our worldly vision of what a kingdom should look like. It's Jesus' authority, Jesus' kingdom, and it's not about spiritual self-improvement. In other words, it's not just about me. My discipleship is not just me learning more and growing more so that I can say that I learned more or grew more. Kind of like the, the difference between exercising just for vanity or exercising for health or for a purpose of some kind. Um, and so uh, to be in a church where you want to be fed, have you ever heard this or thought this, a church that will feed me? And I would say it's good to be fed like the things of God and the truth of Scripture and, and what it means to know him and it's so rich. And, um, but there's a difference between being fed for my own sake or being fed for a purpose beyond myself. And so one way to think of this, if you were to compare the caloric intake of an Olympic athlete and me on Thanksgiving. (laughs) It might be similar, right? I I read somewhere, I think some Olympic athletes take in as many as 12,000 calories of food a day when they're training, right? And I might take in about that much on Thanksgiving, to be honest with you. What are they doing with theirs, though? It's for a purpose, right? It's for something more than just, because what am I doing with mine? I'm watching football and taking a nap. Right? So to be followers of Jesus, friends and followers of Jesus, yes, let's be fed. Let's be churches that value that, prioritize the deep nourishment of God's rich truth. At the same time, the goal is not to feed people so they come back to be fed again, so they come back to be fed again, so they come back to be fed again. That's called gluttony. That's not good. We're talking about being fed, nourished, to be equipped, to be sent out, to bear witness to the reign of God in Jesus Christ. That's our call as the church, and that's what we're a part of as disciples in community together. Um, Friends and followers called and commissioned for a purpose beyond themselves, and so in that being called to be sent out, verse 19, Jesus starts to point in that direction. So he's gathered them, and then he's talking about how they're gonna be sent, and he says this, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. That word go in the English, we treat treat it like go like a command, like it's a command. In the original language, it's not a command. It's a different kind of word. A better translation in the original language might be something like as you go or in your going, on the journey, on the way. The going is assumed, right? Because we're always going somewhere, aren't we? And for some of us, the call of God is going to be a particular kind of thing that maybe the going is like going to another country as a missionary. That can be a beautiful thing. For most of us, it's not going to be that. For most of us, we're not going to go overseas. For most of us, we're going to the store or we're going to a friend's house or we're going to work. As you are going on the journey, wherever it is, our call, our commission is making disciples of all 
peoples. The going is more about the, past, the posture of our lives as ones who are sent out. Um, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says it this way. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Let's bring that up on the screen. This is after Jesus has died, has risen, has spent time with his friends and followers, and now he's about to ascend or return to the right hand of God the Father. And it says this, that they, the followers that he had at that time, gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice first here, his followers were asking kind of an empire-building question, weren't they? They were asking about this kingdom of, of being restored to Israel, kind of like the empire just for us. And Jesus gave them a kingdom witnessing answer. So, so don't worry about that empire building stuff. Here's what you need to know. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to bear witness. You're going to carry with you the story of this new reality of the kingdom of God and of Jesus, its king. The Great Commission Church has got to make its focus on equipping or and sending her people not just serving and pleasing her people. Remember, disciples are not consumers. We're all participants. We're all witnesses. We're all ambassadors. And that's really, I think that's an exciting part. The genius of God's plan here is like the diffusive influence that this means. And so rather than it be like there's professional Christians, like the guy who's paid to stand up here and do this, and it's my job to do all of the witnessing stuff, because even if that were the plan, I would question some of the wisdom because where am I going to go this week? I could map out for you what my schedule says, and I'm sure I'll have some surprises along the way, but it's going to be a limited number of places, limited number of conversations, limited number of opportunities. But instead, if it's actually all of us, like literally everybody in this room and the folks who were here at 9 o'clock, and the folks in all of our churches all over the place, if it's actually where we are going, sometimes in like small groups intentionally together, most of the time just as you go, how many conversations is that? How many opportunities is that? How many encounters is that? There's a diffusive brilliance to God's plan for discipleship here. Um, at the church that I planted, we would intentionally celebrate the ways that people outside the structured life of the church were out there bearing witness in our local community. So we focus real specifically on Beaver Falls, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, small post-industrial Rust Belt town, economically divested. We've made that home, right? lived there, rooted there. And people called in commission to bear witness do all kinds of incredible things there. So Christine, who started her children's museum, uh, to create equitable access to play-based learning. Um, you've got John and Kate with their street chaplaincy, provided places and conversations of belonging for those on the margins of society. Uh, you've got a, a ministry for people affected by incarceration that Abby and Kobe are deeply a part of, a, a person on the city council. You've got a therapist, economic development work, um, a couple folks who their gift is really as, as sidewalk uh, kindness is, is they just spend a lot of time walking the sidewalks, but they're smiling and they're encouraging people as they go. Uh, all of these kingdom ambassadors, just with the opportunity to demonstrate the good news of the hope that they have found in Jesus Christ, and then equipped to then proclaim, tell about where that hope comes from when the opportunity comes, right? So we don't tell them, stop doing that and do the church stuff instead. No, we have church stuff that we do, but it's meant to kind of springboard into a life where this is the case, right? That's like the genius of how God has put this thing together through local communities of faith, just like, just like this one. Verses 19 and 20. In that going, as you go, making disciples of all nations. And that word nations, the word ethne means people groups, right? And so let's not skip too quickly past the radically embracing message of all peoples, of all nations. There is no ethnic partiality in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? We have got to keep coming back to that, unfortunately, time and again, to make it real clear. There is no ethnic partiality in the kingdom of God. His call is for uh, people from all nations, all people groups. 
And notice it doesn't say this. It doesn't say, as you go, make converts to a new religion. What's it say? Make disciples. And what does it mean to make disciples? He says it right there. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey or observe everything that I have commanded you. There's a belonging in baptism, right? The conversion that happens, it's not just making not nice people into nicer people, it's dead people come to life, right? That encounter with Christ, you're a new creation, that's happening, and the baptism is our sacrament, our sign and our seal to mark that new reality. So that's a part of it, but it doesn't end there. Baptized, belonging, a friend of Jesus, and now teaching them to obey teaching them to observe, learning how to follow Jesus as his followers. So friends in baptism, followers learning how to obey. The church is called for both of those things. So we go out, we share the good news of the gospel, and as people come to know Jesus, we equip them to live on the same mission that we're on too. Again, no, no classes here of more qualified or less qualified, everyone on that journey. And when it talks about here, um, teaching, for some of us, I think this is where it can be a little bit of a hang-up because we tend to think of teaching and learning in a particular kind of way. It's usually a classroom kind of way. So my bachelor's is in education. I'm a huge fan of education, big champion of public education, uh, lots of incredible opportunities for people to learn in those environments. Um, however, Sometimes we can get into the thinking that to really teach is to stand up in front and talk at people, and to really learn is to sit there and listen and try to remember it, and then later take some tests to see if you still remember it and to say that you've learned. Right? That, that is not the way of the ancient world. The teaching that it's talking about is much more in that Jewish sense of being a rabbi and a follower. Jesus was a rabbi of his disciples, his followers, and their life was simply following him, listening to him, and doing what he did. Trying and then having conversation and learning and growing, but following so closely to their rabbi, the phrase, the rabbinic phrase was, uh, you want to be a disciple who is so close that you are covered in the dust of your rabbi. Because you're so close that the, the dust that he's kicking up with his feet is getting on you. Right? So there's a closeness and there's an action that's involved. It's not like go sit in a classroom for 12 years, master it, and then show what you know. It's learning as you go. It's a different kind of learning. Um, the obeying everything I have commanded you, we're observing everything I have commanded you, but this, this, is, this is where it's at. This is where it's at. Eugene Peterson called uh, discipleship a long obedience in the same direction. Friends of Jesus following him together. Um, and I think of it, that kind of learning that it's talking about, less like um, taking a math test, learning math and taking a test, and more like learning to drive. So I have three teenagers. My oldest, is uh, he has his driver's permit right now, his learner's permit, and he's getting his hours in to then take the driving test. Um, I was in Ohio when I got my driver's license, but that was like over 25 years ago. Um, I heard from the first service that you do driver's hours now the same way. Is that correct? You get a learner's permit, you learn the stuff in your head, but you don't get to take the driver's test yet because the assumption is what? There's a difference between knowing it in your head and knowing how to actually drive the car. Now imagine if my son put in no driving hours and went back to the department and said, hey, I'm ready for my license. And they said, show us your hours. And he said, oh, don't worry. I actually memorized the driver's manual. I know every section of that chapter and verse. In fact, I know it so well, I learned Japanese so I knew the original language of this car. And I could tell you everything about the, I got some friends together and we studied, what would it look like if we drove the car today? How would that really, did you ever drive the car? No, okay. Right? There's a praxis, there's, there's a put it into practice. That's what we mean in discipleship. You're not being called to get all the information up here mastered before you live it out. As we're learning, we're going and we're growing together. That's why I love the community groups as a great way for a larger church to try to live this out in relationship. But it's the practice of it. And friends, that's not just for our own sake, that's actually the power of our witness. If we can tell people all the right answers, but it's never demonstrated in our lives in any way, 
it's simply not compelling, especially in the world as it is today. Brendan Manning once said it this way, that the single greatest cause for atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And so there's a witness to this life of discipleship. For the Great Commission Church committed to kingdom witnessing disciples, a really important reminder for us in this is this is something that is cultivated. It is not coerced. It's not forced. Um, Discipleship is a journey, friends, and it's often messy. It's not a formula that we apply or a box that we make or a system that we manufacture. And so for some of us, it's helpful to think of it less mechanically, kind of like industrial. Here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, 20. Here's the steps, here's the outcome. Think of it more organically. Think of it maybe a a, a lot more like gardening. Do any of you garden or farming families? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah, so the work of gardening. There's intention there, isn't there? There's intentionality, but then it's not controlling. Right, so, so sometimes churches can get kind of so far into the God does it that, that we say, well, we'll just preach the word and God will take care of the rest. Well, that's a little bit like if you take a bunch of seed and just chuck it up in the air and let it drop and say, look, we're gardening. Is that gardening? I'm not a gardener, but I'm pretty sure that's not gardening. Right? But at the same time, some churches are gonna say, okay, we have to structure this so step one through 58, it's exactly like this, And anyone who doesn't fit that ends up kind of feeling the shame of like, I guess I'm not really a follower of Jesus. That's kind of like someone who takes already grown plants and fruit and just sticks it in their ground and says, look, we gardened. I say, probably not. No, there's cultivating and tending. There's things you do as a church, as people in each other's lives, but then there's a lot of like stand back and watch what God does. And it's gonna surprise us sometimes, friends. And that's part of the beauty of it. And when we encounter it, The fruit of the Spirit, back to that gardening idea, that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we see that in each other's lives, we can celebrate that. We can encourage one another in that. We can praise God for that. And sometimes it's gonna come from very unexpected places. So friends, an encouragement, it's not a performance. This obedience, this observing what God has taught. This is not about us performing and proving to God that we're worthy. It's being shaped from the inside out. New creations he's made us. That's what baptism represents. And now the outside of our lives is catching up to what's most true on the inside. That's true as individuals and it's true, it's true of us together. It's about being made new in Christ and now being shaped to that new identity, creating a new life for the world to see. Because just like it starts with Jesus, the Great Commission starts with Jesus, it ends with Jesus. Because notice at the end in verse 20, he doesn't give them this commission and then say, good luck, I'll check in in a couple years. I hope you've performed well. He doesn't say that, what's he say? And I am with you always. I, Jesus, am with you, that's us, always. That's a comfort for us. And it's a reminder to us. It's about following Jesus where he leads. That's what it's about. Uh, Mother Teresa, um, she wasn't Presbyterian, but she's still pretty great. Um, I I love Mother Teresa's stories. And one Mother Teresa story I I remember was her being interviewed uh, by someone famous. And they said, um, you know, Mother Teresa, you are world famous. Um, You can command uh, thousands of dollars a speech. You could take that money and do amazing things. You could organize big movements. Why are you in a village in Calcutta with dying people? You could change the world. And she said, I wasn't called to change the world. I was called to follow Jesus. And sometimes for us remembering the difference, God is changing the world. Our call is to follow him. We don't build the kingdom, friends. We bear witness to the kingdom that God is building. When we try and build it, it gets really twisted and warped and doesn't actually resemble the real thing. When we are obedient to him, to follow him, not to change the world, but to follow Jesus, to be a healthy corner of the garden where he has planted us, Bay Prez, where he has planted you, you in your life where you are planted, to learn how to know and to love God and your neighbor, 
there's something about that that bears witness. And we can encourage each other in that work together, knowing that Jesus is with us. In John chapter 20, verses 21 to 22, when he's with his disciples, this is after his resurrection, he appears to them through a locked door. He breathes his spirit on them. That's called inspiration. He inspires them with, this, with the Holy Spirit. He says this. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the sent God from God. God the Son, sent from God the Father. Sending the Spirit into us to send us into the world that he loves so much. To bear witness to the way that he is making all things new. And what does he say here? I'm with you always until the very end of the age. The end of the age of the church. The end of the age until the age to come when Christ returns again and brings with him all the uninterrupted fullness of his kingdom. And until that day, friends, we who are called to be his people, who belong in him and who grow in him and who share the reason for our hope, the church is not meant to call men and women out of the world into a safe religious enclave, but to call them out in order to send them back in as agents of God's kingship. It's not just you, it's our whole denominational family, and praise God, it's way bigger than that too, for God's glory and for the life of his world, amen.